Jerry, yeah. we're live. Thank you, Yvette. Good morning, everybody. This is Drew Bartlett, Executive Director for the South Florida Water Management District. Thank you for joining us for the RAC Public Forum. Um, it's great to be able to have these public forums, even though we are still under COVID operations at the Water Management District with our building closed. And uh, certainly we can still have these discussions. We've become quite adept at it using Zoom. Um, so we will uh, certainly get something out of this public forum. And I really appreciate everyone dialing in, whether you're a participant or not. I look forward to hearing from all of you who wish to participate. Um, right now it's March 25th. The Lake Okeechobee is over 14 and a half feet. And, you know, we are doing everything we can between the water management district and the Corps of Engineers to safely uh, lower lake levels um, in preparation for the wet season. Uh, hopefully with hopes of maybe avoiding harmful discharges during the wet season. Um, certainly our objective is to lower the lake in a non-harmful way. And one of those tools that we use is moving water to the Everglades through the stormwater treatment areas. Now that the conservation areas have receded uh, after a tropical storm Ada and are able to take water uh, into the conservation areas through the stormwater treatment areas. So we put this public forum together today to um, uh, really talk about management of the stormwater treatment areas uh, and the system as we look at the levels of Lake Okeechobee and look at options to manage those levels. Uh, so we have three presenters um, to, uh, to sort of lay the foundation for the discussion. And that will start uh, with Sue Lynn Kirkland, who's our excellent operator, chief operator for the Water Management District, who will give us a presentation from an engineering and operations standpoint of the CNSF system and how it works in conjunction uh, around Lake Okeechobee with the stormwater treatment areas. And then we'll move over to Lawrence Glenn, who will give us a history of the stormwater uh, treatment areas uh, so we know how they came into being. And then we will turn it over to Tracy Picone, who advises us uh, weekly on the status of the stormwater treatment areas and the opportunities that exist to move water through them. So that what I want to do is get all that on the table with the three presenters before we you know, get into discussion. So if you have questions during those presentations, please uh, save them for item six, which is the discussion portion. Uh, so that then if you have questions, you can ask them. If you have thoughts, you can share them and we can get into a discussion with the RAC uh, participants at that time. And so to the RAC participants, I'm gonna ask you to use the raise hand feature during uh, agenda item six. Uh, and then certainly unmute yourself uh, when speaking uh, and so that we can have that discussion. If you're, use, if you're participating via phone, uh, you can use star nine to raise your hand and then star six to mute and unmute. Of course, we're also interested in hearing from the public. And so for members of the public, that will happen at agenda item seven. Again, if you're using Zoom, you can use the raise hand feature and be sure to unmute yourself when we call on you for the three minute public comment period. Um, if you're having trouble uh, with the Zoom, uh, you can go to our website, sfwmd.gov, and click the Ask Us button, and we can try to help you uh, get connected and participate in this public meeting. So I look forward to this discussion. Um, there's a lot of good material to talk about, but what we'll start the meeting off with is a video that gives, you know, for, I know a lot of the participants probably have a good understanding of the of the operational system that the South Florida Water Management District and the Corps of Engineers uses. But let's go ahead and start with a video that uh, does a quick overview before we turn it over to Sue Lynn uh, to do the first presentation. Thank you. Yvette, I don't hear any sound from the presentation.
the waters of the Everglades once flowed slowly south from the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes just south of present-day Orlando through the meandering Kissimmee River Valley to the liquid heart of the Everglades, Lake Okeechobee. During the rainy season, the lake, known as Big Water by the Seminole Indians, would then swell and water overflowed its banks and flowed south through the Everglades. This was nature untouched. Today, South Florida's water flow is highly managed to meet the needs of more than 9 million residents and millions of visitors. Because of this, too little water flows south like it once did and too much precious water is flushed to tide. While we cannot return the system to what it was before development, progress is being made each day to better balance the ecosystem's needs with the quality of life for people in South Florida. Restoration efforts by the South Florida Water Management District and its partners share a goal of sending more water south. The concept is clear, but not simple to achieve. Portions of the Kissimmee River that were turned into a straight canal are returning to their historic meandering flow. But the water flow must still be managed to prevent flooding homes and businesses. Lake Okeechobee's natural banks were replaced with the Herbert Hoover Dyke in the 1930s, following devastating hurricanes resulting in a massive loss of life. Today, the Herbert Hoover Dyke protects communities from flooding. The management of the lake serves multiple purposes, public safety to prevent flooding, water needs for people and the environment, navigation and recreation, and its own ecological health. Water managers must balance these needs daily, rain or shine, storm or calm. To balance these needs, scientists and engineers follow an operating plan developed in 2008 known as the Lake Okeechobee Regulation Schedule, or LORS 08. This schedule lays out how the lake's level is managed based on the time of year, weather forecasts, supply demands, ecological health, and the capacity of the structures to move water where it's needed. While many of these factors can vary on any given day, there are several considerations that must be made while we work to get more water south. First, the structures that move water south from Lake Okeechobee have a fixed capacity to move water. Once water has left the liquid heart of Florida, it travels through a network of canals, each with its own capacity limit. Send too much and flooding can occur. Send too little and the environment suffers and water users cannot get the water they need. Water is also the lifeblood of the Everglades and it must be clean. The next consideration is the ability of the stormwater treatment areas, called STAs, to clean the water. Water is moved through a series of expansive human-made wetlands that use natural vegetation to remove nutrients from the water. While highly effective, these wetlands also have a maximum capacity to keep their plants healthy. So do the pumps that move water in and out of the STAs. As you can imagine, send too much or too little and the wetland does not function properly. Once it's clean, water is then moved into the central Everglades, home to what most people think of when they think of the Everglades. The central Everglades are expansive sawgrass wetlands where the right levels of water continue to be important. These wetlands also known as the water conservation areas, have capacity limits and conveyance limits. Only so much water can move through the central Everglades at a time. An array of wildlife also call these wetlands home, as do remnant Everglades tree islands. Too little or too much water alters the cycle of life here. And at the central Everglades border, 
are some of the most heavily populated communities in the state, like Boca Raton, Coral Springs, and Miami Lakes. Even when the conditions are right in the central Everglades, the road to delivering this clean, fresh water where it's most needed, Everglades National Park, remains a challenge. Once a symbol of the progress for South Floridians, Tamiami Trail's roadway still inhibits the flow of water south. Now a series of bridges and gates are helping restore the historic flow patterns to help get water from the central Everglades into Everglades National Park. Many considerations go into decisions about getting water into the park. There must be enough water in the central Everglades to get water into Everglades National Park. And if there is enough water to get water into the Everglades National Park, water managers still must consider things like flood protection for the communities in the western Miami-Dade County and the breeding season of the federally endangered Cape Sable Seaside Sparrow. Throughout the entire South Florida system, managing water is a challenging task. From the Kissimmee chain of lakes to the very southern tip of the state, the South Florida Water Management District's mission remains the same. To safeguard and restore South Florida's water resources and ecosystems, to protect our communities from flooding, and to meet the region's water needs while connecting with the public and stakeholders. Thank you. That was a that's a great video, and um, unfortunately, Sulin, you get to go first after J.K.'s melodious voice. Um, and uh, you know, he is our helicopter pilot for the district, and you know, he's a he's just a wonderful voice person as well. Um, anyway, Sulin, I will turn it over to you, and uh, you know, tell us what you know. Thank you, Sulin. You do have control. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, following JK is going to be a, a tough act to follow. Uh, thank you, Drew, for the introduction. And thank you all for the opportunity to, to provide you with an overview of the primary infrastructure responsible for moving water from Lake Okeechobee to the Central Everglades. Before getting to the routes for moving water south, I will briefly talk about Lake Okeechobee, the agricultural areas, recent and current projects, and considerations and constraints for moving water south. Yvette, I'm having trouble uh, advancing the screen. Okay, I'll go ahead and advance for you um, and turn on the pointer. Are we on the slide that you'd like, Suen? Oh, uh, yes, we are. Proceed. Okay. Lake Okeechobee is the heart of the South Florida Water Resources Area. It has a surface area of 730 square miles, which is only about one fifth of the area of the tributary basins flowing into Lake Okeechobee. The outflow capacity from Lake Okeechobee is less than its inflow capacity. This, along with the size of the tributary, makes lake stage rise rapidly following rain events, and it takes much longer to return the lake level to pre-storm stages. The lake stage is managed for multiple, often competing benefits. Flood control for public health and safety, water supply for agriculture, urban, and the environment, recreation, navigation, and saltwater intrusion risk reduction. Lake Okeechobee flood control operations follow the Army Corps of Engineers LORS 2008 water control plan, which provides guidance on discharges from the lake to the estuaries and south to the central Everglades. There is an update to this water control plan currently underway, 
and the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual, also called LOSUM, is expected to be in place in 2022 and will replace the LORS 2008. Next slide, please, Yvette. So Lynn, it's on the next slide. I'm still seeing the previous one. Okay, there we go. The Everglades Agricultural Area is between Lake Okeechobee and the stormwater treatment areas. The original CNSF project did not include treatment components of stormwater treatment areas or flow equalization basins. The network of major canals provided and continues to provide flood control to the agricultural areas as well as supplemental irrigation. Runoff originally discharged directly into the central Everglades or back into the lake. Over time, it was recognized and realized that runoff and lake releases moving south into the central Everglades needs to meet stricter water quality standards. The South Florida Water Management District constructed and further expanded four STAs, one west, two, three, four, and five, six, and two flow equalization basins, the A1 and the L8. STA1 East was built by the Army Corps of Engineers and transferred to the South Florida Water Management District. These STAs are located at the boundary between the agricultural areas and the Everglades. Runoff is primarily sent south through the STAs for treatment before discharging into the Everglades. Runoff back pumping into the lake is now used only when absolutely necessary and there is risk of imminent flood concerns. The flow equalization basins or FEBs are used to help the stormwater treatment areas achieve water quality requirements by capturing peak runoff during storm events, holding the water, and then gradually releasing the water to the STAs in between rainfall events. <clears throat> These major canals have multiple purposes. They provide both flood control and water supply. At times, the canal, the canal capacity is completely taken up with local basin runoff as a result of rainfall, or the canals must be drawn down in advance of a forecasted storm event. At other times, Meeting the water supply needs take up the entire canal or structure capacity, leaving none available to deliver additional lake water to the Everglades. Once flood conditions are alleviated or there is structure and canal conveyance availability, in addition to water supply demands, consideration is then given to using the canals to send Lake Okeechobee water south to the central Everglades. It should be noted that the hydraulic treatment capacity of the STAs is not unlimited and is another consideration on when and where to send lake releases south. Long periods of flow, especially high flows, will overload the cells and damage the vegetation. Lawrence and Tracy will expand on this aspect a little later. Uh, next slide, please, Yvette. Three major projects necessary to consistently move excess water to the south are either complete, underway, or in process. <clears throat> when completed, an additional 370,000 acre feet annual average of water can be sent south. In addition to the original STAs, STA 1 East, 1 West, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6, the three major projects are restoration strategies, modified water deliveries, and the Central Everglades planning projects. The restoration strategies project included the L8 FEB and A1 FEB, which are complete and operational, as well as the stormwater treatment area 1 West expansion, which is under construction, and the C139 FEB, which is just beginning construction. The modified, waters delivery, the modified water deliveries project components 
are complete and operating under the Combined Operating Plan, or COP. However, as most of you know, additional features are needed to provide flood mitigation to the eight and a half square mile area to maximize COP operations. And the seepage cutoff wall for this purpose was just approved at the March Governing Board. Finally, there is the, the Central Everglades Planning Project, or SEP. And although I, don't, although I don't expect you to be able to see all the details, the image on the left outlines the many components of the project. SEP is necessary to move additional water south, and individual components are already coming online, and others are under construction. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This slide depicts many of the constraints and considerations for moving water south, including a couple that I have already mentioned, as well as those mentioned in the earlier video. I will quickly go through each of them. And Yvette, if you could um, advance the slide to get the, um, the constraints to pop up on the right-hand side of the slide. We have weather patterns, and with that includes current conditions, current forecast, longer term forecast, and confidence in that forecast. We have the Herbert Hoover Dyke levee safety and stages within Lake Okeechobee, which also ties in to the Lake Okeechobee Water Control Plan, currently LORS 2008. Structure capacity, canal conveyance capacity, species protection, STA treatment capacity, pump capacity, STA 5.6 connectivity, wildlife management areas and their stages, water level limitations for tree islands and wildlife in the central Everglades. Next one, Yvette. Lower East Coast Canal Conveyance. And the next one. Levee safety for the East Coast levee system. Next one, please. Slow, and, and the next one. Slow limitations due to structural and, op and operational constraints. And finally, flood risk constraints. Okay, that's it for that slide. Next slide, please, Yvette. Okay, so we have talked a little bit about Lake Okeechobee the Everglades agricultural areas, some of the project treatment areas and water management components already in place and in the queue, as well as a long list of factors that go into the constraints of moving water south. Let's now go over the reasons to send lake water south and the primary routes to do so. The reasons for sending lake water south include regulatory releases to the STAs in central Everglades, supplemental irrigation to the Losa basins, water supply to the urban areas for municipalities, well fields, lower east coast urban areas, and salt water intrusion risk reduction, environmental releases to the Everglades and water management areas, and stormwater treatment area hydration. Now, I'm assuming you cannot see my, my mouse on the screen, correct? Correct. Okay, thank but you. I can, I can point for you if you'd like. Uh, we advanced um, one more slide. If you could go back one, please.
So Lynn, we're in slide six. Yeah, this is, this is the correct slide, thank you. So there are two primary structures and three primary canals used for sending lake water south. The S351 structure connects Lake Okeechobee to the Hillsborough and the North New River canals and can be used to send lake water to stormwater treatment area two, as well as STA34 and the A1FEB. This route is also used for water supply to the users within the Hillsborough and North New River canals. The S354 structure, which is over to the, to the, to the west, connects Lake Okeechobee to the Miami River Canal and can be used to send lake water to stormwater treatment, stormwater treatment area 3-4 and the A1FEB. This route is also used for water supply to users within the Miami Canal Basin. Discharges from the A1FEB can be directed to stormwater treatment area 3-4, STA-2, or back to the North New River Canal for water supply needs. An unexpected benefit that we have seen in operating the A1FEB is pretreatment before water enters the stormwater treatment areas. Therefore, when conditions allow, we route water such that it flows through the A1FEB before we move it into the STAs. When moving lake water south, flow through the A1FEB is best accomplished by discharging water through S354 to the Miami Canal, then into the A1FEB released out of the A1FEB and then pumped either into STA34 or STA2. <clears throat> there are two additional outlet structures and canals that are mainly used for water supply and STA hydration. The S271 structure was previously known as Culvert 10A before the Army Corps of Engineers recently replaced it as part of the Herbert Hoover Dyke Rehabilitation Project. S-271 connects Lake Okeechobee to the L-8 canal. This path is primarily used for water supply needs for users in the L-8 canal and the C-51 canal, as well as hydration to the STA-1 East and STA-1 West. The S-352 structure connects Lake Okeechobee to the West Palm Beach Canal. This route can be used for water supply to users along the West Palm Beach Canal, as well as for hydration and water supply to stormwater treatment area 1 East and 1 West, and users in the L8 Canal and the C51 Canal. However, the water first needs to be pumped by S5A in order to reach these other areas. All four of these Lake Okeechobee structures are owned and maintained by the Army Corps of Engineers. South Florida, South Florida Water Management District operates S351, S352, and S354, while the Corps of Engineers operates S271 in close coordination with the Water Management District. Next slide, please. So water is, in, is now in the STAs. So what's next? Where does it go? From the STAs, the water then moves into the Central Everglades. STA 1 East and STA 1 West discharges enter into Water Conservation Area 1. Once in Conservation Area 1, water can remain there or it can be sent to Conservation Area 2A via the, the S10s or to the Lower East Coast primarily Palm Beach County, for water supply. STA2 discharges into Water Conservation Area 2A. Once in 2A, water can remain in 2A, sent to Conservation Area 2B via the S-144, S-145, and S-146 structures, sent to Water Conservation Area 3A by the S-11s, or when conditions allow and are desirable, sent to Conservation Area 3A by reverse flowing through the S7 pump station into the STA 34 outflow canal 
And from here, water can then be released to the northwest corner of 3A or the northeast corner of 3A, depending on stages. These northern portions of Water Conservation Area 3A tend to dry out, and scientists often request available water to be sent to the northwest and northeast 3A in order to support nesting and prevention of muck fires. And this is primarily in the dry season. Water from Water Conservation Area 2A can and is also sent to the Lower East Coast, primarily Broward County, for water supply. STA 3-4 discharges into Conservation Area 3A. Once in 3A, water is then released in accordance with the Tamiami Trail flow formula under COP via the S333 and the S12 at the southern end of the system or to the Lower East Coast, Miami-Dade Miami County, and the South Dade Conveyance System for water supply and saltwater intrusion risk reduction. STA 5-6, which is the, um, the green on the very western portion of this slide, towards the top. You will notice that I didn't talk about Lake Okeechobee water to STA 5-6 earlier. This is because there is no direct hydraulic connection from Lake Okeechobee to stormwater treatment area 5-6, although there is a project currently under consideration for this connection. For now, it is primarily runoff that makes its way into STA 5-6, which then makes its way into Water Conservation Area 3-A. And one final comment on the STA releases is that when needed, STA 3-4 and STA 5-6 can also discharge into the Holy Land and Rotenberger wildlife management areas, the yellow areas on the slide. Next slide, please. So that wraps up my presentation. Thank you again for the opportunity to review to review the primary infrastructure and routes to send lake releases south to the central Everglades. Thank you, Sue Lynn, and, and thank to, thanks to you and your team for everything you do for managing water in the South Florida Water Management District, uh, in particular during really dry times and really wet times when I know your staff really have to work hard to make things happen uh, for the citizens of South Florida. Next, we'll turn it over to Lawrence Glenn uh, who will give us a little bit of backdrop for the history of the stormwater treatment areas. Over to you, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. And uh, again, I'll echo Sue Lynn's comments and thanks for the opportunity to be here before the RAC today to give you uh, basically a historical overview of the Everglades stormwater treatment areas. Can you give me do you have control? Yes, you do have control. Okay. Um, it's not, yeah, if, if you would advance for me, because it's not advancing. Um, to really understand what the STAs, how they came about, we have to look at the actions that prompted their construction. And this came from three primary actions. Uh, one was the USA lawsuit, uh, the next is the Everglades Forever Act, and then formation of the state's phosphorus rule. Next slide, please. So the USA lawsuit uh, occurred in 1988, and this was when the U.S. filed suit against FDP and the Water Management District, um, claiming damage occurring on federal property from EAA runoff. And this was a, a federal case, so they were worried about federal properties, and that tends to look at the refuge, which is over on the right-hand side of water conservation area. One is also termed the refuge, and then Everglades National Park down in the bottom in green. So what resulted out of this was a settlement agreement in 1991 and a consent decree in 1992. And what the consent decree did is it uh, the court was given enforcement jurisdiction over the parties and the terms of this agreement, of the settlement agreement. So next slide. Um, what the goals of the consent decree 
are is to reduce phosphorus loads from the EAA going into the Everglades protection area. And the Everglades protection area is gonna be all of the water conservation areas and down into Everglades National Park. And to reduce phosphorus loads, it, it said you need to construct SDA stormwater treatment areas, which are filter marshes with the sole purpose of extracting phosphorus from uh, the water as it goes through, so cleansing that. Um, to implement BMPs, to create a 25% load reduction of water leaving the EAA before it goes into the SDA. So let's clean up the water a bit from it leaving the EAA, put that water through the STAs, and then we'll have cleaner water going down into the Everglades. Um, it said we also needed to conduct research and monitoring, and that was looking at what the phosphorus limits are on a regular basis in Everglades National Park and the refuge. So what, what discharges go in there and what the associated wa uh, water quality is. And then we needed to determine numeric nutrient criteria for the Everglades as a state uh, goal. Next. So Appendix A and Appendix B are the two portions of the consent decree that's, that lay out what the phosphorus limits are for the two different regions, Everglades National Park and Refuge. So on the left-hand side, Appendix A set total phosphorus limits to the inflow to Everglades National Park. And that's at Shark River Slough, which is the, the larger green slough in the top, and then Taylor Slough, which is the smaller slough at the bottom. And they're a little bit different in, in how they were determined um, for this is all inflow. So at Shark River Slough, at those inflow points, there is a range of um, phosphorus concentrations that could be between 7.6 parts per billion and 12.8 eight parts per billion on an annual flow weighted mean. And so what a flow weighted mean does is this, because this is a flow dependent measurement of flow entering into the park, it allows you to uh, account for the, the volume of flow that's coming in along with the concentration of phosphorus that's coming in. And so it is going to allow high, uh, you know, when you're looking at your data and your data is all, all you know, scattered out, it's going to consider the highs and the lows proportionally rather than when you have like a central tendency, like a median that, that really focuses on the central portion of the data and not the outlier. So this kind of makes all the data a little more equivalent. And then for Taylor Slough, um, it wasn't a, a range, but it was a fixed 11 parts per billion on an annual flow weighted mean. Now we move over to the refuge and the phosphorus limit that was set there was for 14 interior sites. And because this isn't flow um, associated, it's stage dependent, they use a geometric mean, which is more of that mean I talked about. If you think of a bell curve, it's what's the more central tendency of the data. So for these 14 interior sites, it's a range of 7.2 parts per billion to 17.5 parts per billion, again, on a, a monthly geometric mean. And the interesting thing in these data is that for both of Appendix A and Appendix B, they are based on a federal water year, and that runs from October 1 to September 30. Instead of the district, we use a, a district, the water year from May 1st to April 30. Next slide. Now, the Everglades Forever Act and the Phosphorus Rule. Um, a little different than what we've talked about on the, on the front side. So the state of Florida adopted the Everglades Forever Act in 1994, and it also said construct the STAs and implement BMP so that we can reduce phosphorus uh, loads and concentrations that are going down into the Everglades. Um, but here we wanted to, the, the state wanted to extend the water quality efforts to the entire uh, Everglades protection area. So that's water conservation areas one, the refuge, and water conservation area two, and water conservation area three, but also including Everglades National Park. Um, it level levied the um, ag privilege tax uh, for the EAA and the C-139 basins, and then it uh, said to develop state phosphorus numeric nutrient criteria as well. So the phosphorus rule was established or adopted in 2004. So FDEP adopted a state numeric uh, phosphorus criterion for the Everglades protection area. For the water conservation areas, 
This is a 10 part per billion annual geometric mean. So this also is through transect data or different locations throughout. It's not a flow weighted mean. It's a, what is the concentration at these stages or, or at these stations, I'm sorry. But it also considered impacted areas and non-impacted areas or unimpacted areas. And an impacted area was an area that had a, a soil with greater than 500 milligrams per kilogram of phosphorus in the upper 10 centimeter layer of that soil. It didn't say that you didn't have to meet the phosphorus criteria here. It just said that some areas are more impacted than others. It gives that consideration and, and, and basically stated that it might take some of these areas a little longer time to reach that or meet that criterion than the unimpacted areas. In the refuge, it went a little more stringent than what was set out in the consent decree. And instead of that range, it said, nope, just like the rest of the uh, water conservation areas, it's a 10 part per billion annual geometric mean. And this was with 24 marsh stations instead of 14. But for the Everglades National Park, it adopted the phosphorus limits that were set in the consent decree appendix A. Next slide, please. So the next thing that came about is the gold case. And this is where the Miccosukee Indians of Florida filed suit against the US EPA. And they were challenging the two, 2003 Everglades Forever Act Amendment and the 2004 phosphorus rule. And they claimed that USA, US EPA violated the Clean Water Act because it did not consider the amendments to be a change in water quality standards. And thus, the EPA did not evaluate them under the Clean Water Act before the, the, allowing the state to adopt the phosphorus rule. Um, this uh, led to Judge Gold saying, okay, I need you to go back and evaluate them under the Clean Water Act and then provide a determination. So the amended determination was rendered in 2010 and approved by, uh, by Judge Gold in 2012. It approved the state numeric nutrient criteria in the phosphorus rule, but without the moderating provisions. And what the moderating provisions were is the, the amended 2003 uh, Everglades Forever Act had extended the date to meet the phosphorus criteria. And it also was using something called T-bells instead of Q-bells, which said there was a 50 parts per billion goal, but that that level would um, decrease and through time, as our technology got better, uh, Judge Gold uh, kind of threw out the T-bells and said, no, you're going to meet a Q-bell, which is what we do now, which is a water quality based affluent limit, not technology. Um, and he said that we needed to issue NPDES and EFA permits to all of the operating structures of the uh, STAs and to meet the Q-bell. And the Q-bell is a two-part test. And what it is, is it says that total phosphorus long-term flow weighted mean of 13 parts per billion should not be exceeded in more than three out of five years on a rolling basis. And you can't have a maximum total phosphorus annual flow weighted mean greater than, 15, uh, greater than 19 parts per billion in any water year. So that's what was established through the goal case. Next slide. So to meet the Q-bell and the state criteria, this diagram on the left gives you a really good indication of what we're trying to do. You have phosphorus reduction methods on the y-axis and water quality improvement measures on the x-axis. So what you're doing is you're taking BMPs. BMPs were established and they have to at least reduce phosphorus loads from the EAA by 25%. So that's your initial phosphorus reduction of water going from the EAA into the STAs. Now the STAs provide the second reduction of phosphorus. Um, we're gonna find out through this next couple of slides that the STAs alone as they were originally designed weren't enough to meet the Q-bell. So restoration strategies uh, came into, projects came into place and that is construction of the A1L8 and the C139 basin FEBs and then expansion of the STAs. So you implement restoration strategies and that's the final phosphorus reduction to meet the cubo. So if you look over at the, the diagram on the right-hand side, you have 
MPDS and EFA permits and consent orders that are working on those outflow structures of all the STAs. Um, within Water Conservation Area 1, you have phosphorus criteria in both Appendix A and the state phosphorus rule. Um, in Water Conservation Areas 2, you need to meet the phosphorus rule. And for Everglades National Park, you have to meet Appendix A and the phosphorus rule. Now, a lot of people get confused. Um, there's a lot of numbers out there. And so the QBEL is talking about that uh, 13 parts per billion, three out of five years, or don't exceed 19. Now, what that means is the water coming out of the STAs is supposed to meet that so that the water quality criterion of 10 within the, the networks of, of uh, gauges within the Everglades meets 10. So water leaving has to be of a certain quality and it's going to continue to get cleansed as it moves through the Everglades. Um, if it's too high coming in, then you exceed those interior marsh uh, criteria of 10 parts per billion. So that's what this is all based on. Next slide. So then with all that information, let's go back and, and say, see what the actual STA project purposes are. So the 1998 lawsuit, USA lawsuit, the settlement agreement and the 1994 Everglades Forever Act state that the primary objective of the STAs is to treat EAA runoff. And so the EAA consists of the S5A, the S6, the S7, and the S8 basins. And a secondary objective under these guiding principles is to treat runoff from the C-139 and the C-51 West basins and five special drainage districts that were those purple areas along the bottom of Lake Okeechobee. So what, it, the law, what these project purposes are is to increase water sent to the Everglades because what happened in those purple areas, those used to discharge back into Lake Okeechobee and the C-139 and the C-51 mostly went to tide or to the Lake Worth estuary. So if we reduce the discharges to Lake Worth estuary to tide into Lake Okeechobee, we can take that water and send it to the Everglades. So originally there were 40,000 acres of STAs and they were designed to achieve an internal phosphorus load or an interim phosphorus load of 50 parts per billion. So that they were sized to, to meet a certain goal and they had the total design of average STA inflow volume was 1.16 million acre feet. Now, because lake regulatory releases aren't a primary objective, but the central flowway, which consists mostly of STA 3-4 and STA 2, there was a BAP calculation done to see how much lake water can we take and still meet that 50 parts per billion goal. And that volume was 250,000 acre feet or 20% of the total that the STAs would push through. Next slide. Now, Judge Gold's order 2012 restoration strategies and the 2013 Everglades Forever Act amendment have the same project purposes as the original, but now we have to meet the Q-Bell. So in order to meet the Q-Bell, um, that original 40,000 acres of STAs could not do it. So this is where there was an expansion from 40,000 to 64,000 acres of STAs and addition of three flow equalization basins, as Sue Lin said, to moderate those inflows, to take the flashiness away from how water is, is brought into the STAs and to moderate that to allow the, the STAs to be most efficient. Um, so with that additional acreage, that restoration strategies is supposed to meet the 13 parts per billion of the QBEL or the 19, no greater than 19 in any one year. Um, now the total design average annual STA volume inflow is 1.4 million acre feet. When we did the same back calculation of what uh, what allowance or capacity there was for treating lake regulatory water that was reduced from 250 to 58,000 acre feet or 4% of the total. Next slide, please. This slide is gonna walk you through a timeline of 
how much acreage is available in the STAs and the FEBs since we started this whole project. So in 1995, it was the beginning of the ENR or the Everglades Nutrient Removal Project. And we were trying to figure out how to, how to size STAs, how to, you know, everything, all the science behind the STA. How do you develop them? How do you put them in the ground? How do they work? So those first cells were from 1995 to 1997, where we were getting our information on how to build STAs. So the first STA, which is STA-6, came online in 1998, followed by STA-5 in 1999. STAs 1 and 2 then came online between 2001 and 2003. STA-4 came online in 2004. And then STA-1 East was online in uh, 2005. So that red line there shows you everything to the left is the original 40,000 acres of STAs. And the goal at that time was to meet 50 parts per billion. Um, moving to the right again, um, we had the ability to increase the size of STA two and five, six with addition of compartment B and compartment C, and those were built out between 2006 and 2015. And then the green line in 2013, and between 2012 and 13 shows, okay, this is when the Q-Bell came into place. And so after Q-Bell comes into place, then we needed to implement, construct the restoration strategies projects. So the A1 FEB came online in 2016, the L8 FEB came online in 2017, STA-1 West expansion was completed in 2019, and the remaining restoration strategies projects will be complete by 2025, at which time uh, we'll have to reach QBEL compliance. Over. Um, next, let's look at what the STA inflows and the percentage of lake releases are through time. And then you see that it, it varies on years. There's one year in particular that is discussed often, and that's year 2015, where you see the STAs took 43% of, of the inflows were from the lake. Now, how the STAs work, as uh, Sue Lynn had, had mentioned, they are primarily for runoff from the EAA. So depending on where rainfall occurs over the landscape, if it occurs directly over the EAA and over the STAs, that diminishes our ability to take lake regulatory releases into uh, the Everglades. But in 2015, the majority of rainfall occurred north of the lake. So the EAA runoff was low and that allowed us to take that greater capacity of lake releases because we had the capacity in the STAs. Um, something else that you're gonna see in the data as you fall out from 2013 moving to the right uh, 2013, uh, some refer to it as the lost summer of 2013, and this was a year in which uh, the lake releases, uh, we had to release a lot of water from the lake and mostly went to the estuaries and in a damaging fashion. And so following 2013, you'll see that the district had a, a change in mindset on how uh, we were going to use the STAs to help mitigate flows um, going to the estuaries. Uh, when the capacity was available and in consideration of the STA vegetation. So this data clearly shows that, you know, from that time moving forward, we definitely looked at the opportunities that were available to move water, lake water, to the STAs. Um, one of the, the things that I just mentioned was in consideration of STA vegetation health. And uh, that's a good jumping off point and segue to where Tracy is going to come in now to tell you uh, what the health of the STAs is currently. So I uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, thanks for giving that uh, presentation. Um, there's a lot of information there, a lot of numbers, um, you know, but I think when it comes down to it, you know, there's a lot of modeling numbers and, and uh, about the expectations for the STAs. When it comes down to how to use the STAs, it gets more into... Um, where can we move it and what STA flowways are available for moving water, which is where Tracy Picone will pick up. 
Um, and so Tracy, I will turn it over to you to uh, talk about where we are with our stormwater treatment areas. Thank you. Drew, we're in the process of um, pulling up the pre next presentation. Um, if you could please give us about 60 seconds. All right. Tracy, you have control. Okay, thanks. Quick mic check, can you hear me okay? I hear you fine, Tracy, thanks. Okay, great, thanks Drew and thanks Lawrence for the introduction. Uh, good morning to RAC participants and members of the public. Today I will be presenting a status update on the Everglades STAs. Make sure, let me, sorry, I need to try to move the slide, I guess, okay. Does it seem like I have control of that? Yes, you do. Okay. Let me get the pointer. Okay. All right. Today I will be presenting a status update on the Everglades STAs in the context of their current capacity to treat Lake Okeechobee regulatory releases. The focus of my presentation will be the STAs south of Lake Okeechobee, located in and adjacent to the Everglades Agricultural Area, or the EAA. Starting on the east side of the map, STA1 East is located on the east side of WCA1, or the Loxahatchee Wildlife Refuge, and tr treats primarily runoff from the C51 West and LA basins and discharges to the refuge. STA-1 West, which is located on the west side of the refuge, treats runoff from the S5A EAA basin and discharges to the refuge. STA-2 and STA-3-4, which are in the central region of the EAA, treat runoff from the S6, S7, and S8 EAA basin. STA-2 discharges to WCA-2A and STA-3-4 discharges to WCA-2A and WCA-3A. I will not be presenting an update on STA-5-6, which treats runoff from the C-139 basin to the west of the AA and does not currently have the infrastructure to receive lake water. Not shown on the map are the five special drainage districts on the south side of Lake Okeechobee, which Lawrence mentioned, which previously discharged to the lake and now primarily discharged south to the STAs. It is important to note that the STAs were designed to operate within the regional flood protection system, meaning the STA inflow pump stations must operate to provide flood protection to the upstream agricultural, urban, and residential areas. Simply stated, when it rains in the basin, the resulting runoff is discharged out of the basin canal into the district's primary canal system and this runoff water is then pumped out of the district's canals into the STAs 
for treatment prior to discharge south to the Everglades. Before I discuss current STA conditions, I would like to review how STAs remove phosphorus from inflow water prior to discharging treated water to the downstream water bodies. STAs are man-made wetlands that retain nutrients through plant and microbial uptake, particulate settling, and chemical processes. Starting on the left side of the diagram in the red circle, water enters the STA through the inflow pump stations and gated structures. In the front region of the STAs, cattails and other emergent wetland plants that thrive in high nutrient conditions are used to begin the treatment process. In this region, particulate phosphorus settling occurs and the plants uptake phosphorus from the sediments. Loss of the cattail in the front region of the STA is problematic because without it, water with higher nutrients enters the regions of the STA that contain the submerged aquatic vegetation or SAV, and algae that are adapted to and function best in lower nutrient concentrations. Further into the flow path, submerged aquatic vegetation uptakes phosphorus in the water column, and rooted SAV can also uptake phosphorus through their roots. Emergent plants in large strips and patches in this region of the STA help evenly distribute water flow and reduce velocity through the SAV as well as protect the SAB from wind and wave action during storms. Microbes in the marsh sediment and decaying vegetation throughout the STA also uptake phosphorus, and algae such as paraphyton in the downstream portions of well-performing STAs are efficient at phosphorus reduction in low nutrient environments. Burial of the phosphorus in the STA soil is the long-term storage mechanism. STAs are very efficient at removing phosphorus from surface water as long as they contain healthy vegetation throughout the entire flow path. Just like natural wetlands, STAs benefit from a dry season and shallower depth. Extended periods of water depths above three feet result in die-off of marsh vegetation. And instead of an STA, the area essentially becomes like a pond which cannot remove phosphorus as well as an STA. Before I leave this slide, I want to mention how STAs are designed or sized to achieve a target discharge phosphorus concentration. Using the anticipated inflow volumes and phosphorus loads, the STA acreage needed to achieve the target discharge concentration can be calculated using a calibrated mathematical model. Sending flows and phosphorus loads above those used in the design typically results in increases in the output concentrations, meaning the STA may not achieve its mandated discharge limit. This is a critical take home message. Various construction and vegetation management activities, which are currently underway to allow the STAs to achieve the water quality based effluent limit, which Lawrence described, will be discussed next. Beginning with STA 1E, Historical issues with the topography and vegetation, vegetation health in cells five and seven are currently being addressed by the Restoration Strategies Project to fill and grade cells five and seven in the Western Flowway. The picture on the left shows the filling and leveling work in cell seven, a 400 acre treatment cell. Since the start of operation of ST1 East in 2005, this cell was as much as two feet too low in large portions of the cell, which resulted in year-round excessive water depths, cattail die-off, and poor treatment performance. The black pipe in the center of the picture near the cursor is part of the hydraulic dredge equipment that is pumping soil from the west distribution cell shown in gray on the map in the center and conveying the soil into the cell to raise and level the ground. The use of this on-site fill material is accelerating the schedule and providing a significant cost savings for this project. The picture on the right shows the leveling work in cell five, a 500 acre treatment cell. This cell had highly uneven topography, but unlike cell seven, the cell did not need any imported material, just leveling to create conditions to promote even flow patterns and healthy cattail growth. The filling and leveling work in the Western Flowway is scheduled to be completed in April 2022, followed by the vegetation planting and growing phase 
before the flowway will be operational. While the Western flowway is offline, all inflows to ST1 East are going to the central and Eastern flowways. And as a result, these two flowways currently have very high phosphorus loading rates. This simply means that there's too much phosphorus coming into the STA for the wetland vegetation to retain it, resulting in increased outflow phosphorus concentrations. In addition to very high flows and phosphorus loading rates in the central and eastern flowways of SC1 East, the vegetation in these two flowways is currently highly stressed. The photo on the right shows conditions in cell one, a cell targeted to be mainly emergent vegetation such as cattail and bulrush. Instead, the cell contains large amounts of floating aquatic vegetation or FAV, which is most of the green areas shown in the photo and a patch of willow, which is shown in the red circle. Floating aquatic vegetation is problematic because it invades cattail areas, crowding out the cattail and leading to further cattail loss and open water areas as shown in the bottom left of the photo. Willow is undesirable because it grows in the shallower areas and causes soil buildup build around the roots, which obstructs flow and creates short circuits in adjacent areas. Willow also serves as nesting and roosting habitat, which can function as a nutrient input to the STA. FAV and willow treatment is currently ongoing in cell one. Cell three in the central flowway also contains, contains large areas of FAV and willow, as well as approximately 300 acres of floating tussocks in the front portion of the cell. Prolonged deep water conditions in the emergent vegetation contributes to the formation of floating tussocks, which once formed are very hard to control. Floating tussocks become mobile during high winds and high flows, which causes resuspension of sediments into the water column and the destruction of the desired emergent and SAV communities. Efforts are underway to try to break up the tussocks in cell three using our airboats and the marsh master and amphibious marsh buggy and FAV and willow treatment is also underway in cell three. Before I leave here, I wanna mention that this, it was not easy to find a single picture that clearly shows the poor vegetation conditions in this highly stressed cell. Later in the presentation, I will show pictures of other cells, some with healthy vegetation and some with highly stressed vegetation conditions that should help give a better understanding of what we mean when we say that a cell has highly stressed vegetation conditions. Moving on to SC1 West, major refurbishment projects are currently underway in all three flowways, which comprise the original 1995 Everglades Nutrient Removal Project and SC1 West, which was completed in 2000. These flowways now deliver flows to the SC1 West Expansion Project, which recently started operations. The refurbishment work includes removing an, an existing angled levee between cells 2A and 5B, building a straight levee in its place as shown in the photo, removing a levee and culverts between cells 2B and 4, as well as grading the south 100 acres of cell 3 and filling three canals that are no longer needed hydraulically. Together, these projects are intended to improve the hydraulic flow patterns and vegetation conditions in these flowways, and as a result, the phosphorus retention of ST1 West. During the current construction work, flow and stage restrictions are in place to facilitate the contractor's activities. These refurbishment projects are scheduled to be completed by March 2022, followed by vegetation planting and grow in before returning to normal operations. Continuing with the STA 1 West refurbishment, this photo highlights a portion of the grading and leveling work in the south end of cell three on the right, as well as construction related to the ST1 West expansion number two project on the left that is also affecting current operations in ST1 West. This highlights the amount of major construction and earthwork activities currently underway in ST1 West, which are limiting this STA's flow through capacity. This work was initi initiated early this dry season when rainfall and runoff was low and the water managers have been able to utilize the L8 FEB in combination with ST1 East 
to accept inflows that would otherwise have needed to be sent through ST1 West. Temporary berms are being created, created in strategic locations inside the cells to isolate the work areas from the rest of the treatment area, which will allow limited flow through capacity for this STA once the wet season begins. In addition to the refurbishment projects currently underway in ST1 West, the vegetation conditions in all three flowways of this STA are considered highly stressed. An example of the highly stressed vegetation in ST1 West is shown in the photo on the right of cell 1A. Large open water areas of cattail dial and large amounts of floating aquatic vegetation are found in these areas where cattail and other emergent plants such as bulrush are needed. FAV treatments are currently underway in cell 1A to prepare the eastern flowway to accept inflows this coming wet season. Similar work is underway in cell 5A and 5B of ST1 West as well, as well as emergent vegetation planting to prepare the northern flowway for this upcoming wet season. Refurbishment projects currently underway in STA2 consist of filling the 500 acre unvegetated low ground area in the northwest corner of cell two and regrading the high ground area in the northeast portion of the cell, referred to as the regrade area. Filling the 500 acre area in the northwest corner will provide the proper conditions for emergent vegetation growth and together with the regrading work in the northeast portion of the cell, a more level ground elevation across the northern end of the cell to promote uniform sheet flow across the cell and maximize the utilization of a more fully vegetated treatment cell. The photo on the left shows the west leg of the dewatering berm constructed around the northeast regrade area, as shown by the red line in the center schematic. The photo on the right shows the dewatered northeast regrade area and the start of the, the grading work. In addition to the filling and grading work in the north end of cell two, the deteriorated plugs in the borrow canal that runs along the east side of the cell will be restored using high quality imported fill material. A similar plug restoration project will be completed in cell three of this same STA following the installation of large cuts in the remnant farm roads, which were left in place during the original STA2 construction. This work will promote more even flow distribution across cell three, which is anticipated to improve this cell's phosphorus retention performance as well. These photos highlight the progress in filling the Northwest 500 acre low ground area in cell two of ST2. The photo on the left shows the start of the filling work in an approximate 10 or 15 acre portion of the fill area. This is a staging area where the fill will eventually be spread out across the larger open area. The photo on the right provides some perspective on the size of this filling project since the filled area is a small sliver compared to the remainder of the area that needs to be filled. Cell two is currently under flow restrictions to facilitate the filling and grading work. Cell three is also under restrictions to facilitate vegetation enhancement activity to prepare, prepare that cell for limited inflows this coming wet season. The refurbishment work in SDA two, cells two and three is scheduled to be completed by December, 2022. Before leaving SDA two, I want to highlight SDA two cell one as an example of a healthy cattail treatment cell. This cell has been receiving the majority of the lake regulatory releases that have been going south so far this dry season. Cell seven and eight, which comprise flowway five shown on the map, have been receiving lake water during the same period, but to a lesser extent due to vegetation health issues in cell seven. This is an example of a cell with highly stressed vegetation that we have been using to treat and send lake water south this dry season. In this case, even though cell seven has poor vegetation conditions, cell eight, which is the downstream cell, is a healthy mixed marsh cell, which has been able to produce low outflow phosphorus concentrations. 
in the interest of moving as much lake water south as possible, work to address the poor vegetation conditions in cell seven has been postponed for this dry season. As discussed earlier, cells two and three have ongoing construction work and vegetation management work, which is restricting their current ability to receive inflows. The remaining flowway of ST2, which is flowway four, comprised of cells four, five, and six, has ongoing activities to address floating aquatic vegetation and vegetation rehabilitation work, which are restricting this flowway's ability to receive water this dry season. And before moving to SD34, now that I've shown what a healthy cattail cell looks like, I wanna show it side by side with an unhealthy or highly stressed treatment cell. Notice the large open water areas in the photo on the right, as well as islands of floating vegetation surrounded by bright green floating aquatic vegetation. Compare this with the photo on the left of a fully vegetated cattail marsh with no open water areas or areas of bright green floating aquatic vegetation. STA2 cell one is a model for how all of our cattail cells should look and perform. Moving on now to STA34, the largest of the STAs at over 16,000 acres. STA34 consists of emergent cells in the upstream cells shown in green on the map and a mix of submerged aquatic vegetation and emergent vegetation in the downstream cells shown in blue. This STA generally receives moderate inflow concentrations compared to the other STAs and the addition of the A1 FEB, which you heard about earlier, has helped to further attenuate inflow concentrations and high flows to this STA. Even though STA34 performance has been very good in recent years, front end vegetation damage has occurred from back to back years of high inflow volumes and high water depths. The large photo on the right shows just a portion of the 3000 acre cell 1A, which is indicative of the current conditions in most of the cell a cell categorized as having highly stressed vegetation and the reason for the drawdown and vegetation rehabilitation project that is currently underway. Similar to the other highly stressed cattail cells shown on previous slides, this cell has large areas of open water, lots of cattail, floating tussocks, and floating aquatic vegetation. The inset photo is a close-up of an area of floating and dying cattail plants and condition found throughout much of cell 1A. The drawdown of cell 1A is currently being accomplished by temporary pumps installed around the exterior of the cell. The drawdown will allow natural recruitment and regrowth of cattail plants, as well as planting of other emergent plants, such as bulrush, in strategic areas of the cell. The areas around the recently installed energy dissipators at the cell 1A inflow structures will also be replanted during this drawdown since the plants that were planted last year were not able to get established before the STA started receiving inflows and they did not survive the wet season. The photo on the left shows one of the recently installed temporary pumps with cell 1A, which is the cell being drained on the left side of the photo and cell 2A, the cell receiving the dewatering water on the right. The photo in the middle is an enlargement of the temporary pump to show that this type of installation requires making a cut in, the, in a section of the levee to install the piping and filling the cut area to allow continued traffic along the levee. After the drawdown is complete, the piping and pump will be removed and the levee will be restored to re the original condition. The graphic on the far right shows the location of the temporary pumps for the cell 1A drawdown, as well as a pump that is being used to hydrate and maintain the vegetation in the downstream cell 1B during the drawdown. This drawdown and rehabilitation effort is expected to occur over the next year to year and a half, with the year and a half mark as the targeted timeframe for full vegetation grow in. Depending on how well the initial vegetation grows in and how the new plantings are doing, the cell may be able to receive restricted inflows at around the six month mark. Until then, this cell is offline and unavailable to receive any inflows. Like cell 1A, cell 2A of STA34 
is experiencing tussock formation and cattail loss due to many years of high inflow volumes and extended deep water conditions, particularly in the front portion of the cell as shown in the red circle. FAV treatments, which were recently completed in the STA34 inflow canal, have restricted the use of this STA to treat lake releases so far this dry season. This is because it was important to treat the exotic FAV in the canal upstream of the STA treatment cells to avoid further spreading of the FAV into the treatment cells where it becomes much more difficult to address. Work to address the highly stressed vegetation conditions in cell 2A, including replanting the vegetation around the energy dissipators that were installed last year, has been postponed to a future dry season to allow cell 2A to start to receive lake releases either later this month or in early April. Cell 3A on the far left is currently in the best condition of the three front end cells in this STA, but it too has been receiving high inflows for numerous back-to-back -back years requiring FAV treatment and replanting the vegetation around the rock energy dissipators that were installed last year. The plantings are intended to fill in the short circuit that formed downstream of the inflow culverts over many years of high inflows. The photo on the bottom left shows the bulrush plantings in the short circuit behind the rocks. This cell is expected to have capacity to accept lake releases once the plantings around the energy dissipators are complete and have become established. We, are currently, we currently estimate this will be around June. District staff, staff will continue to meet on a weekly basis to evaluate conditions around the STAs, taking into consideration ongoing construction projects, vegetation conditions, and vegetation management activities to determine which cells have capacity to accept lake releases without damaging the vegetation that are critical to achieving the required discharge phosphorus concentrations. And with that, I will turn it back over to Drew. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, great presentation, I really appreciate it. So I hope that was helpful for everyone uh, participating in this RAC public forum. What I'll do now um, is ask if any RAC participants have any questions, comments, or anything they'd like to put on the table um, for discussion. So I will look and see if you, if you do, you know, just raise your hand and I will call on you uh, to unmute yourself. I see the first hand we have raised is Doug Gaston from Audubon. Doug, please, thank you. Good morning, Drew, how are you? Thank you. Um for putting this together and to the presenters, really good information um, and very, very helpful. So thank you very much. Um, I, I think my first question is related to Tracy's presentation and that is what percentage of the STAs um, are online and operating at optimal performance? Is there, do you have a, a, a sense of what that percentage is? And then how does that impact your ability to move water, um, you know, in, in terms of the volume of flow and all the things you need to do to move water around? Good question, Doug. Uh, Tracy, please. Um, thanks for that question, Doug. Um, you know, currently I would say that we have a, a fairly small percentage of the STA acreage that we would consider as healthy. Um, there's, there's quite a bit of work underway and that's usually what we want to do during the dry season. We want to use that time when we're not um, dealing with a lot of runoff to go in and do vegetation work. And, and the, the, the vegetation definitely takes quite a hit during the wet season. Um, even with the FEVs in place, which have been very helpful, we still have to go in in the dry season and, and rehab uh, quite a bit of the, the vegetation across the STAs. And this year in particular, we've been dealing with 
some new FAV, um, some exotics that are kind of new to the SDA. So that's also been work that's needed to be done, um, you know, in the dry season. But, you know, ho hopefully that answers your question. And I think, Tracy, I'll just sort of um, glom on. So basically, we look at all the STAs with respect to how many flowways they have and the size of their flowways per STA. And it ranges between three large flowways and three, four to like five flowways and other STAs. And, and, and so we look to see which flowways we can move CFS of water through. The help that the one that Tracy pointed out, which was flowway four, I a one in STA two, was the one that is probably healthy. The rest are not in healthy conditions, but that doesn't mean we don't use them. We also look for opportunities to delay maintenance um, or so forth, which is why we're using flow A5 and two. But I can't remember, Tracy, how much CFS are we putting through the healthy one in flow A, I think it was four, uh, the one in flow STA2, the healthy flow way. We're currently sending on the order of about uh, three or 400 CFS, I believe, through flowway one of ST2. Yeah. And then I think we're sending, you know, one or 200 CFS through flowway five, which is not healthy, but we're postponing maintenance. Does that get at your question, Correct. Doug? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I guess to state the obvious, if the if a higher percentage of the STAs were actually functioning at the levels that you designed them for, we would be able to move a little bit more water uh, more quickly, you know, in light of the conditions on Lake Okeechobee. Is that, is that accurate? I think that's a fair way to put it. What do you think, Tracy? Okay. Yes, I, I agree. If, if we had um, healthier treatment cells across a larger percentage of the STAs, then as we have been doing in recent years, we would look for every opportunity to send at least some water through these, these STAs. And in the dry season, some, in some years, that's actually a small flow going through these STAs is actually helpful because um, they can get too dry even, um, and drying out is not something that we, we want to happen. So just a quick follow-up, if, if I could. Um, yeah, sure. So do STAs have the equivalent of what we would think of as a useful life? Um, or, or is it really just a function of your, your management of uh, the vegetation in those areas? And of course, you, want me you to know, take that rain, through? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so as far as a useful life, um, there's a couple aspects there that we look at. So one would be um, that, as, as I mentioned in my earlier slides about how STAs retain phosphorus, which is ultimately through the, the burial in the sediment. So the, the, you would imagine that the, the bottom is filling up with sediment over time. So one of the things that's always been on the table for STAs is some sort of long-term um, maintenance work involving potentially going in and, and removing some of that sediment. Because as you build that sediment in the bottom, you're losing hydraulic capacity. So that is on the table. We have not had to do a lot of that yet. We've had, we have done some of, some of that type of work um, on a STA that's say about 20 years old but we haven't had to yet go in and do a lot of wholesale scraping um, in, in that regard. The vegetation, um, what, we're, what we're hoping is if we can get these STAs healthy and get a lot of the things that um, maybe weren't done optimally from the beginning um, through the refurbishment project now, we're hoping that we can at least get these STAs into more of a healthy condition. And as long as we don't overload them, send too much water or, you know, uh, you know, overload them hydraulically and from a phosphorus loading perspective, then they would be more sustainable. They, they should be sustainable, but the current, in the current situation, they're just, they're not healthy enough to, to keep getting hit with so much flow and phosphorus and produce the concentrations they need. The way I look at it, Doug, is the, um, 
we have a footprint, we have berms and we have vegetation to manage in an STA. And just like a pump station, you know, that does have a useful life, you have to rebuild them every once in a while. And so at some point in the future, which is something we monitor, we will have to take a cell and rebuild it. Uh, but then it will be back to, you know, a functioning cell, just like we'd have a pump that's back to a functioning pump. So that, uh, so that they do, they are areas of indefinite opportunity when it comes to phosphorus removal. It just takes management. Thanks, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll yield the floor to others who have questions. Thanks, Doug. The next hand I saw raised was Steve Davis. Sorry, I needed to unmute myself there. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the, the opportunity to uh, pinch hit for Jeff Mullins, uh, the Everglades Foundation. Uh, I found this to be a really helpful presentation or set of presentations. Um, as a wetland scientist by training, I, I, I get the sort of balancing act that's needed to, you know, maximize flow, optimize performance, maintain the vegetation, uh, and, and that you're really pressed up against the ceiling um, during the, the wet season, the wettest times of year when obviously water is, is you know, quite abundant uh, in the EAA. But I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, with uh, a couple of the slides, I, I really enjoyed um, all the presentations, but there was something in Lawrence's presentation um, that sort of talked about calculation of, of um, lake regulatory capacity in, in the STAs. And, and I'm just kind of wondering uh, how that's calculated. Um, is, is there a consistent I understand it likely comes out of the, the lower schedule, but I'm, I'm wondering what lake stage constraints are used to, to calculate that because obviously at the, at the dry end of the, the water year, uh, you've got not only a demand within the STAs that Tracy just alluded to, but you've got a, a, a much greater environmental demand downstream, um, not just in, in Northern 3A that was mentioned, but also downstream in Everglades National Park and certainly Florida Bay. Um, so just wondering how that, that lake regulatory capacity was calculated and how, you know, might be able to take advantage of, of water in the lake to, to meet demand downstream during those drier periods. And that certainly would not cause any harm or, or stress to these STA cells that are being overloaded in the wet season. And Thanks, Steve. This, Steve, this is Lawrence. Uh, being more of a wetland science myself, uh, I'm gonna turn this one to Tracy, the engineer, who's much better with those large calculation numbers than I am. So Tracy, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. So the original STA sizing uh, model that was used was a fairly simple first order equation by Dr. Bill Walker. And, and it essentially you just use the expected flows through the STAs, the expected concentrations that would be coming into the STAs. And then with your target outflow concentration, you can back calculate the area you need. And again, this is it's the 1995 Dr. Bill Walker, um, the, the original equation used for sizing all of the STAs that Lawrence mentioned from the 1994 Everglades Forever Act. So that was a fairly simple model, if you will, um, uh, to come up with a calc to calculate capacity. So using the flows and expected concentrations and loads from the sources that were, that were in the 1994 design, they took the area that they had um, for ST34 and, they, and the 50 parts per billion alpha target, and they were able to back calculate that volume that Lawrence mentioned, the 250,000 acre feet. In recent years, since that time, a more sophisticated model has been developed called DMSTA, again, by Dr. Bill Walker. And that model uses the same general concept as the original equation, but it has more bells and whistles in it. It incorporates more of the biological um, components of the STA, but essentially does the same thing in that you, again, you, you, you tell the model what kind of flows and inflow concentrations do you expect 
to come into the, the footprint that you have, and it will calculate the outflow concentration. So when LORS was developed back in 2008, actually it was around 2007, it went into effect in 2008, um, DMSTA was used. And the goal again at that time was that STAs needed to achieve closer to a 10 parts per billion outflow target, not, not 50. And at that time, when, when that newer model was used to update the capacity for lake water, that's when that 58, approximately 58,000 or 60,000 acre foot um, on an average annual basis, that's when that number um, was developed. So that was used in LORS as, as a, um, basically a stop. It was, it was to only send the water through the STAs up to that amount. And again, average annual basis. It wasn't an annual amount. So that's, that's again, that's kind of the history of where, how it went from 250,000 acre feet for lake water down to, down to the 58,000. Does so that, that answer your question? It, it does to some extent. So as a follow-up to that, I assume that's the, the, the 4% um, the, the down uh, shift in, in lake capacity uh, that, that you described there. But, but you know, we've heard um, through planning processes the, um, you know, unused capacity or available capacity in the STAs um, and, and how, you know, with, with implementation of the, the Everglades Reservoir, how that capacity could be taken advantage of and and also just a, a observing you know extended periods where you have um, you know a, a very modest amount of water going into the SDAs presumably for maintenance in the dry season but uh, zero water or, or very little water coming out the downstream uh, you know, logic would suggest that that's available capacity. And if there's water in the lake and just recognizing the, the need to, to balance the you know, water across the system as much as possible, uh, it, it would seem that instead of relying on what a model output might tell you that that's, that's available capacity to cleanse and flow water south. I, I think- Question. I think Steve, we're, I think we're seeing that, uh, and I do appreciate that because I think we're seeing that as we are looking at those opportunities, uh, particularly in the planning process uh, that's being undertaken with respect to Losum. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, those numbers are numbers at you know restoration strategies time, right? So I think we'll start seeing updated numbers because we have new a new period of record, new data, new information that can better inform the situation. Um, and I, you know, I just, it, ha it has to be pointed out that those are model numbers, yeah. but we don't actually operate to model numbers. Um, we operate to availability and opportunity. Um, and so like last year, um, after we had sent a lot of water through the STAs and it was, it, you know, we knew the Everglades needed water, we would send water through the STAs to the Everglades just like we are doing now. So it, when you're into to the operating realm and not the modeling realm, you just engage Tracy and say, which flow paths can we use and, and, and go use them. And we really don't pay attention to what the old model run said. That's probably obvious. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And again, mm -hmm. I really appreciate the, the presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Gary Ritter, you got your hand up. Hello, good good evening, good afternoon, um, good morning, whatever. Um, I just wanted to commend Lawrence, Tracy, and uh, Sue Lynn on great presentations. I kind of have a, a, a two-part question, um, and I'll stick with the first part, um, what we've been discussing concerning the, um, the SDA south of the lake. And I'm kind of curious, um, you, you know, we've, we talk about uh, the cost of of the STAs, and then we talk about the operation and maintenance of the STAs. And 
Um, what what are and Drew? This may be a question for you. What what are the um, operation and maintenance costs of these STAs? And and what do you foresee looking in your crystal ball as we move through the integrated delivery schedule and we and we complete all these other projects? Um, how it will increase the operation and maintenance cost of the district's budget in the future? And then I, then I have a follow-up question. So I, I think the number, Gary, we generally use for O&M on the STAs is about 22 million uh, per year. I can tell you this dry season, I basically, you know, talked to staff and said, uh, there's no limit on your budget to try to get these cells back and going and, and running. And so they've got free uh, reign on coming up with whatever they need to come up with to try to get back to, um, you know, more healthy cells and more usable cells in the STAs. Uh, on top of that, you have the refurbishment projects, which are multi-million dollar projects to get them ready. And really, the district has its eye on 2025, which is when we need to start measuring compliance with the Q-Bells and get held accountable to meeting uh, the the numbers on the outflow of the stormwater treatment areas. And so we're really got that date circled to try to get the refurbishments done, to get all the restoration strategies projects done and to get these health, these cells healthy. Um, and so, you know, depending on the year, we, you know, this year is probably gonna be higher than 22 million just because we're trying to get some things taken care of on a routine O&M basis. And then you layer on the refurbishment projects when you start talking about O&M for a lot of projects we have coming online, we've got the C43 reservoir. Uh, we've got the EAA reservoir and STA. Um, the STA, let's look at the next five years, right? So with the STA coming online and the EAA, uh, the A2 STA, the C43 plus treatment with that, the C44 plus treatment with that. And then we have some uh, more local projects like Lakeside Ranch, um, and other, other projects coming online. By year five, we're looking at an increase for all these new works at about $17 million per year as an increase. Um, and then, then that includes, I think, two clusters of ASR wells as well, which are not cheap to operate. So there's a, there's a lot of those kind of demands, um, but it's for you know timing and distribution and putting clean water where it needs to go when it needs to go. So it's a good investment for South Florida. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Gary. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's, it, it, um, and, and the other thing, uh, with the um, additional amount of lake water that you have been pushing through some of the STAs, uh, it, it, you know, it obviously stresses them. Does that increase your operation and maintenance Um of that, and maybe maybe I know the answer to that, but I, I would assume it does. Tracy, do you know the uh, what that? I, I would assume it does too, but I don't know about how much. Yes, I, I agree. I I would assume it does, um, but I wouldn't have a dollar amount to attribute directly to the lake water. Okay, and then, and then my, my last one is, is kind of shifts up to the north end of the lake. And I know, I know we've been kind of focusing on the south end, but um, what, what, and this might be for, for Tracy and uh, I'm sure Lawrence and uh, staff have looked at it, but what, what do you all see the challenges with managing STAs north of the lake given the different soils in hydrology that you have up there? Oh, this is Lawrence. Lawrence. I'll take that one. Sure. Oh. <clears throat> In the northern STAs, you're exactly right. We're we're looking at how they were constructed. Um, some of them have a little too steep of a gradient from the intake to the outflow, so you get dry out in the top part. And the vegetation group is actually looking very hard at what is the appropriate uh, kind of assemblage of vegetation that should be grown in those STAs that can one reduce phosphorus and nutrients, but also might in the header cells might be able to take or uh, withstand you know, that dry out a little bit better. So that's something that they are actively pursuing right now 
is, you know, because they are not the Everglades STAs and, and conditions are different, you just can't apply what was learned in the Everglades STAs to the Northern uh, Everglades STAs. It's, we're still in a, in a little more of a learning process up there. And uh, so we're, but we are working on it and trying to dial those in to where they can be uh, the most efficient possible. Do you, do you see a possibility with, um, with ASR to be able to provide um, supplemental water to some of the, some of the uh, STAs up there to keep them hydrated when, when they appear that there's a, a, a potential of drying out? That's an interesting idea. I don't, uh, I would have to, to check with the crew if that's something that, you know, is, is under consideration. Um, yeah, it is. So just like every ASR, some sort of flow equalization basin type concept to take the water and then have it available during the dry season um, is something we're looking at. But yeah, th that is one of the things staff uh, are looking at with respect to some of those STAs that dry out is where ASR is an opportunity. Uh, one uh, thing I would point out, Gary, is uh, Lakeside Ranch is fully functional now on the north side of Lake Okeechobee. Yeah. And as far as I'm concerned, it's knocking it out of the park. I mean, we're having phosphorus concentrations come in at uh, over 400 and they're going out at less than 40, which is what the lake needs. So it's, it's, uh, it's a real success up there. Um, for that one STA. And it has the ability to stay hydrated because it's connected to the lake. Yeah, that, that is good news. And I, and I appreciate, um, I appreciate the uh, uh, being able to ask the questions and participate in this. It's, this has been a, a, a great forum today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Gary. Uh, next we have Richard Pinsky. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Drew, and thank you to the presenters. You know, when I looked at the agenda, I was trying to think, okay, <laughs> what's Drew up to? What are we, what are we looking at? I, I thought I was actually going to hear something a little bit different. Uh, I, I knew we were going to be discussing the STAs, but I did not realize until I saw the presentation that the STAs were uh, in the, in the um, less than desirable operating uh, capacity. Um, so I wanted to follow up on that budget question I think that Gary had. Um, so this is, an, I'm assuming uh, that this is an annual maintenance issue I think you said we, we, we budget over $20 million a year just to maintain the STAs to, to work uh, properly. Um, but so that begs the question, you know, when did they, when's the last time they operated at like 90% efficiency? I mean, when, when, is this something that we has snuck up on us? Is it because uh, we didn't anticipate the, the phosphorus load? I mean, how do we get to where we are? Uh, uh, if you could give some, some context. Uh, right. and, then, and, then, and, then the, and then the follow up question is going to be uh, in a perfect world and you spent all the money and you fixed them all up. Uh, does that take care of all of the capacity or we still got to talk about uh, you know, getting uh, uh, STA five and six working, maybe a new one. I mean, to, to, to put that in context, if you don't mind, uh, Drew, one of the presenters. Sure. And I, I will give this a whirl, Tracy, and then I can turn it over to you too to see if you have anything to add. And I don't know that, um, so I would say, you know, when, when the goal was to meet 50 parts per billion, um, phosphorus coming out of the STAs. Uh, there was, you know, if you look at what the STAs are doing now, they're all below 50 parts per billion. And, and so now the real challenge is moving to 13 parts per billion, which is what restoration strategies is, and building out the STAs and then making sure that they are in the right condition to continue to meet 13 parts per billion starting in 2025. 
Um, and so that that is kind of what we're under right now with the filling of cells in STA1, with the expansions in STA1 West, uh, and then we're working in 5-6. STAs 2 and 3-4 are in the, you know, almost complete, they are ready for restoration strategies with the exception of getting them ready, which is what we're doing with um, really enhancing their ability to be more resilient uh, with STA2 and the fill there, and, uh, and then getting the vegetation ready in 3-4. Um, so I, I, as far as capacity, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how that, how you would answer that, Tracy, as, as far as when they were whether they were ever at full capacity or something like that. Do you have a way to communicate about that? Yeah, I can try. I just wanted to add that, um, that the 20, approximate 22 million a year for O&M, that's a lot of that is, or the majority of that is operating costs. It's not, it's not the refurb or the vegetation management work that we, we were talking about today. Um, the, the vegetation management budget per year, and this is for all of the STAs north and south of the lake and the FEBs that we're currently operating, um, runs around three to four million a year. So that's just the vegetation management. And in that amount of money is where you would see plantings that I talked about and, and other types of vegetation control. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. So, so you know, the, the larger amount that Drew mentioned covers our large pump stations and fuel and, and labor and mowing and just the kind of uh, maintenance work, um, operating and maintenance work, but not the, the vegetation piece of it. Um, and then as far as when were they ever at full capacity, I would say that as you heard in Lawrence's talk, when the STAs were originally designed to meet 50 parts per billion, they, the STAs, um, as they first came online, they were all exceeding that they they were doing much better than 50 parts per billion so they were um you know performing at at, at what uh, better than the design um some of these projects that we're doing right now the refurb projects refurbishment projects are really fixing things that were never right from the beginning if we had designed an sta to meet the 10 parts per billion or the the q bell number so as Drew said, the, the, the things we're doing right now, as we get closer to the Q-Bell, we're really fixing things that were fine for a 50 part per billion STA, but they're not fine for a 10 part per billion STA. Okay, uh, that, that, and, that, and that, makes, that makes sense. I mean, because that, that, that's the piece that, uh, as I was listening, particularly to the questions from, from uh, the, the, my fellow RAC members, I, I was trying to process that. Um, I do have a question, if you don't mind, on, on STA five and six. Um, and, and let me preface it by this, by saying this. Um, uh, you know, I've lived in South Florida since 1970, Martin County, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach. Uh, I've seen a lot uh, <laughs> come and go. I saw, I saw straight in the Kissimmee. I've, I've seen us, you know, let it go back to natural. I've seen a lot of stuff. Um, I did not realize until I saw that video today, which by the way, that's a great, that's a great video. I don't know how dated it is because it said the population was 9 million people. Uh, and I think we're, we're, we're well above that now. Um, but I didn't realize uh, the EAA uh, and, and we avoided uh, I, I, was, I was kind of chuckling that in that entire video, a matter of fact, most of the presentations today, uh, I think I was either heard or saw the word agriculture. It's five times, that was a lot. Um, so to use today's presentation, I'll call them phosphorus producers. Um, in STA five and six, are there, are there phosphorus producers west of that area, and I guess it would be in the, uh, I'll look at the map to see 139 basin. In other words, are there, are there stresses being put on, even as the East STA one, are there stresses being put on the STAs uh, that were designed for the EAA 
that are causing, in other words, if, if they were, are there other, are there elements outside of the EAA that are using the STAs? And I know water flows in different ways. We sort of have to do that, but um, what, 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 are, what, are those, what are those STAs on the east and west side? Uh, uh, yeah. What, what's happening as far as, is it all EAA or is it people outside of the EAA? So good question, Richard. The, um, so the, the goal is obviously pursuant to the federal consent decree, making sure we put clean water into the uh, Everglades protection area, which is like the, the Loxahatchee, the Central Everglades and Everglades National Park. And so it's all the inputs uh, on, the, on the northern end up there. And so when you look at 5-6, that, that does treat a western basin called the C-139 Basin, which is largely agriculture as well. Um, and so they're, they're, whenever you have a societal footprint, whether it's agriculture or just neighborhoods, you will have a phosphorus load coming in. And so that is an agricultural area that, that five, six, they have to do their BMPs and 5-6 treats that. When you look at 3-4, SDA-2, and SDA-1 West, those are for the Agri Everglades agricultural area. Uh, you know, and then if you look at one east, that is for eastern Palm Beach County. So that's the C-51 canal that drains from West Palm uh, westward over to the one east canal. I mean, one east SDA. So it's, it, it's kind of that whole um, circumference there. Um, so it's, it's multiple basins. Yeah, I, I, uh, and this is my last comment, Drew, and I thank you for allowing me just to ramble on. But um, uh, I look at five and six, and if it's being used outside of the EAA, uh, which is the charge, I mean, going back to the you know, original SERP, I mean, the charge was the STAs to, to, to take care of the EAA. And, and it seems to me, and, and please apologize, I apologize for saying it this way, but my tax dollars, which are going to pay for uh, these these strategies for SERP and in particular the STAs for the EAA somehow those tax dollars are being used for interests outside of the EAA and I would I, I would like to see uh, something equivalent to an STA that the private sector is paying for that that if, if they're using the e, if they're using that STA then you, you know it's kind of like uh, it's like, well, why, why do we even have a demarcation point for the EAA? And, and I'll shut up with that. And uh, I'm off my soapbox, but um, I thank you very much, Drew. And it was a great presentation today. Thank you, Richard. And the one thing I wanted to circle back on was um, while we, we need to meet 13, um, we are seeing success in meeting 13. So for the past number of years, SDA 3 4 is meeting 13 on the outflow. And, and a number of the flowways in STA 2 are meeting 13 on the outflow. Um, and so we do see success. We just want to maintain that success, which is why we lean on Tracy and her team to make sure the STAs continue to function. All right, James Evans, you're next. You got your hand up. Thanks, Drew. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great video. It was very well done, very informative, and great presentations, Sue Lynn, Lawrence, and Tracy. Uh, this is really an important topic, and I want to thank the district for bringing this forward, um, given that you know, the lake levels are high and we're concerned about the potential regulatory discharges that are coming our way this summer and the risk for harmful algal blooms on the lake. So thank you guys for bringing this forward. And uh, I just had a couple of questions, um, and, and it's kind of building on what Richard was asking. And I'm curious, what percentage of the O&M and refurbishment costs are funded by the EAA landowners who really take up the majority of the capacity compared to the other taxpayers throughout the district's service area. Um, Drew, do you have any idea of, of what that breakdown looks like? So I know we've, so we get um, about $11 million from the Ag Privilege Tax per year. And then out of the Everglades Construction Project Tax, which is also for delivering clean water to the Everglades, I believe that's around 35 to 40 million a year. And then the remainder is the Okeechobee Basin tax, uh, which is for SERP and CNSF operations. Uh, and so when you add 
all three together, that's around $160 million per year uh, for, for the whole shoot and match, CNSF, SERP, and restoration strategies. And so that's, that's kind of the breakdown, generally speaking. Okay. And, do and we I can know tell you my budget person would probably put okay. a finer point on that than I would. Yeah, and it would, be, it would be helpful to see the breakdown specifically for the uh, STAs, um, you know, and, and what percentage are, is, is directly coming from the EAA and then what's coming from the rest of the taxpayers within the district. I think that would be just really helpful information uh, to kind of put this all in perspective. Mm -hmm. And then uh, moving on, I just had a question about uh, the impact of subsidence uh, on, you know, the water budget. And I was curious whether or not the district has ever conducted any studies to assess the impact of land subsidence in the EAA on the water budget and whether or not uh, if subsidence is increasing the volume of water pumped from the EAA and ultimately impacting our ability to move more water out of the lake and through the STAs. It just seems to me that the um, that as the land subsides in the EAA, the volume of water pumped off the landscape would increase requiring more treatment capacity. Thanks. Thank you, James. I don't have any insight on that one. I don't know, Sue Lynn, whether you or Lawrence, whether you do. Uh, this is Lawrence, I do not. Um, Sue Lynn, do you? Uh, this is Sue Lynn, no, I do not. Sure, we can look at over time, look at sort of water budget data and so forth, James. Yeah, thanks, Drew. I, I just think it's a moving target. Um, you know, as, as the land subsides, we're trying to maintain a certain level of flood control. Uh, so it seems like we're, we're going to be we're going to be dealing with more water than was anticipated in the original CERP water budget. Um, so I think it's something that we really need to look at a little closer. Making a note. Thank you. Thanks, James. Benita, Benita Whalen. Hello, Drew. Hey, Benita. Thank you for the opportunity to um, comment and very much appreciate um, this very complicated discussion uh, being presented so clearly by Sulan, Lawrence, and Tracy. And responses to the questions by yourself. You took decades of very complicated issues and resolutions and you know presented them in a very concise and understandable measure. So thank you for that. Um, just wanna highlight um, a few things. One of them being Tracy's discussion about the importance in management and maintenance of the stormwater treatment areas. Um, just from the perspective of continuing performance and potential risks of non-performance. Um, I think that that some of the earlier discussions um, when we first started meeting, I know that those were raised and appreciate the timeliness of, of the presentation to discuss those. And I just wanna mention that um, I believe, and I don't know if this was specifically highlighted that there's basically four times, approximately four times on an annual average um, water being delivered from the lake over the restoration strategy, 58,000 acre feet. I don't know if uh, you could just confirm that. I don't know if I could either. You saw the slide that Lawrence uh, presented that had the percentage of lake water coming in. So I, I think it had routinely in the last eight years or so uh, exceeded the quote unquote 4%. Um, but that's, that's where the data is. Okay. Um, and then I'm kind of going to move a little bit and follow on to some, some of Gary's comments where he did discuss north of the lake, the stormwater treatment areas performing it. And I'm glad to hear um, that Lakeside is, is performing so well. I would also like to encourage that, you know, maybe some of the other areas take the approach of some of the public private partnerships that are uh, in place and also performing well, that they're using more of the landscape uh, type approach, mixed systems, you know, upland wetlands, um, 
open areas and, you know, performing well from that perspective. And I know you did mention that the uh, vegetation are, are looking for solutions for potential dry out periods, but uh, I think maybe more of a landscape approach versus uh, the south of the lake, land level uh, compartment cells that that might be worth looking into also. And then finally, I wanna just end with um, mentioning Chairman Goss's comments at the last governing board about you know, the answer to everything we're looking for is more storage and more storage uh, from a perspective of where it's generated farther up north, chain of lakes, it's important where runoff is generated to have that water uh, retained and for recharge and wetland systems. So I would just encourage and follow up on uh, Chairman Goss's comments about additional storage and from our perspective, more storage up in the chain of lakes that is getting more to the source of the volume of water versus just looking at Lake Okeechobee and South. So thank you. Thanks, Manita. Next we have Herb Rayborn. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Drew. Hey, Herb. Uh, I just wanted to say it was fantastic presentations and uh, most of the questions I had have already been asked and answered by the other RAC participants. I, I did have one kind of a, more of a specific question and an interest, I guess, <clears throat> to try to learn some more and I think a detailed answer. Perhaps I could have a conversation with someone at the district uh, about this later, but I'm interested in at least right now, trying to understand in general what the FAV and willow treatments um, that are being done in the STAs, you know, what those are, um, and um, you know, some best practices or things in the event that, uh, say, other organizations might want to do similar things in similar types of facilities on their property. Yeah, Herb, that's... Um... I mean, it's, it's really, I, Tracy, I think it varies. Um, if that'd be worth giving her a, a call to walk him through all the different tools we use. Yes, if, he, if you can reach out to me and, and maybe um, we can just chat offline about that. Perfect. Uh, I'd really like to uh, really like to do that, Tracy. I'll, uh, I'll reach out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Herb. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to go to Grant Lanham. There we go. All right. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I just had a, I just want to commend all of the presenters um, for their presentations. As usual, they're great. Uh, a lot of good information. Um, I had just a couple comments and maybe a couple questions. On uh, Sue Lynn's presentation, she mentioned the uh, LACO inflow capacity is greater than the LACO outflow capacity, and that's why the lake fills up rapidly, and then it takes a while to get that water drained out. Uh, that, to me, that's another good point uh, in favor of uh, the ASRs north of the lake. And also, as Gary Ritter mentioned, uh, having those ASRs potentially be a source for uh, replenishing the STAs during a dry season, uh, that along with that that tool of having the ASRs north of the lake, uh, that that can help balance out the uh, the flows going into the lake. So I think that's a an important tool for you guys to have. Uh, so I would encourage you know the the use of that project. Mm -hmm. uh, Lawrence on his presentation he mentioned uh, there was a uh, he one of his parts uh, was mentioning the EAA uh, the BMP program. And I just wanted to, to note that um, over the uh, history of the EAA BMP programs, uh, I believe they've had a 25 year average reduction of 57%. Uh, they're required a 25% reduction. So the, the farmers in the EAA are, are doing a good job on that. Uh, and actually last year we had a 68% reduction, which is one of the best years on record. 
I think there's only two or three years with a better reduction than, than was last year. So they've been doing very well on the uh, BMP programs. So mm -hmm. I have to uh, give kudos to them for that. Thank you, Grant. Uh, yeah. um, and then I did have a uh, question for Tracy. Um, I, liked, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, how often are the conditions of the STA, uh, the vegetation and the STAs, how often are they assessed? And then how and how are they assessed? Yes, thanks. That's a great question. So we have multiple levels and um, types of vegetation assessment in the STAs, starting with um, a monthly helicopter flight where our vegetation experts fly over all of the STAs and look for issues from the air because there are some things that are, they, the STAs are so large um, that that's the most efficient way to kind of get a, a bird's eye view of everything that we have and to look for the issues. Um, we also have constantly have crews on the field, um, out in the field driving around or in airboats, um, you know, looking for issues, addressing issues. Um, it, it may just be as simple as taking an airboat into some of these areas that have um, floating tussocks and just riding the airboat over it and over it and over it to break it up. So they're out in the, in the field constantly doing things like that. Um, of course, FAV treatment. Um, as I mentioned in my slideshow, it's better to treat it in the upstream canal before it gets into the STA. So they're, they're, they're out in, in that regard quite often. Um, in my part of the district, we have scientists and researchers out in the STAs doing studies on the vegetation. We're constantly looking at um, the different types of vegetation and how well each different type does as far as phosphorus removal, um, different types of SAV, uh, different types of um, uh, emergence that, we're, that are being tried. Cattail are our preferred um, phosphorus removal emergent, but there are some locations where the cattail just, they die off. And um, so plantings are being done uh, to fill in those open areas like a bulrush. Um, so there's many multiple levels of eyes on the vegetation out in the STAs on, on, a, on a daily basis. Okay. Um, I was just, and this just a thought just entered my mind when I was watching your presentation. Um, is there a possibility you could use uh, drones. Uh, I know you can program drones to fly a, a pre-programmed route and take pictures at certain GPS coordinates, and then maybe month by month uh, you could use, uh, you know, uh, review the pictures or have you know use AI to review the pictures to to note any areas that are starting to you know get stressed or whatever. It, it's just an idea I, I thought about when mm -hmm. I was watching your presentation. We have started using drones. Um, it, it's, it's something we're testing out, uh, getting those pictures, as you mentioned, and trying to see if you can tell the difference between SAV or maybe even cattail that's rooted or cattail that's moving, you know, floating tussocks. So, yeah, we have started using drones in, in a re kind of in a research um, uh, type right now. We haven't fully implemented that. Okay. Well, well, good luck in that endeavor. Thank you. That's, and I think that's all the questions and comments I had. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Grant. Next, we have Charles LaPrade. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Charles. Oh, thank you. How's everybody doing? That good. Was, was some really good presentations of the video, um, but I just... I also just want to reiterate the, the need, like we talk about for solutions going to the lake, you know, uh, including ASRs and STAs. And, and um, you know, uh, just uh, want to support the team on getting the, the Southern STAs as healthy as they can be. You know, that's, that's a very important thing that they're healthy and functioning. And um, also want to make sure that uh, <clears throat> as we do those things, that we, we, um, Watch out for high flows to to Miami Dade and our southern areas that, that could be damaging to us down here. So thank you. Thank you, Charles. All right, Gary, I think we're gonna circle around to you as our last as the last one that I see with a hand up. 
Uh, yeah, just I just wanted to follow up on a couple of comments. I, I, I think um, um, uh, it was mentioned uh, concerning storage in the EAA, and one of the one of the BMPs that I that I'm not sure many people are aware of is the the EAA farmers um, do uh, grow rice down there now, and that in the purpose of that, well, obviously twofold. It's a it's a product that they. Um, supply, you know, for us, and and the second thing is is it's is it's grown to reduce subsidence in that area because those fields are are flooded and utilized after some sugarcane growth. So that's that's a BMP that um, that will help um, kind of kind of reduce that subsidence, and it also provides for a bit of store, a bit more storage in the EAA area. And, and then um, secondly, you know, as I, as I heard you talk about the budget, the EAA farmers, um, I think uh, you had mentioned contribute 11 million um, mm -hmm. to uh, STA O&M um, and other types of BMPs in that area. And I would, I would guess given your operation and maintenance budget that you previously discussed with me of, of 22 million, of course, um, some of that um, not part of the dedicated EAA uh, STAs. So I, I'm thinking, you know, EAA farmers are contributing at least 50% of the O&M, if not, if not more, at, at least based on um, what I've heard today. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. All right. Before we go to public comment, I, I, uh, I mean, it feels like a, a perfect opportunity to talk about um, storage uh, and the fact that we are building storage north, south, east, and west of the lake. And when we get that storage online, it's going to do amazing benefits for lake management, uh, avoiding harmful discharges, getting water where it needs to go. Uh, in the dry season uh, for environmental or people. And so I would say within, I mean, right now we've got the C44 coming online this year, uh, or at least finishing construction and starting to get into the initial parts of operation on the East Coast. And then within, in 2023, we'll have a new STA south of the lake that is very much useful for moving lake water south. We'll also have a reservoir um, to begin uh, operational testing uh, on the West Coast. And then hopefully within uh, a year or two after that, we'll have our the first ASR cluster operational and maybe with others to come online soon. So we know we need, we know we need storage north, south, east, and west of the lake, and we're building storage north, south, east, and west of the lake. And it's a very exciting time. Uh, and a necessary time to get all this done right now. And hopefully within five years, we'll be having a very different conversation uh, if we were in the same circumstance we are this year. So Yvette, I am going to turn it over to you to call on public comment. Um, and I look forward to hearing it. Thank you. Great, thank you, Drew. And the, um, Newton Cook. Yeah, Stephen Cook here. Uh, in 20 years, I've uh, had presentations uh, uh, on the SDAs, and I can tell you today was the best in 20 years. And I want to congratulate the group who put this together and made the presentation. Uh, I particularly like the history part where we went back into the 1990s. And sometimes uh, a sentence gets lost in, in these long presentations. The sentence that was important was the SDAs were designed and constructed to clean EAA runoff. That's what they were for as part of the consent decree. They were not designed and constructed to clean lake water. That has come about over the last 20 years. Up until about 2015, they would take lake water when they needed it for hydration not a lot of hate lake water otherwise. Up until around 2015, the SDAs were operating at about 18 parts per billion phosphorus on the average across the ones that were there. 
give or take, obviously, a year here or there. But there were about 18 parts per billion. We started putting lake water through the SDAs, and two things happened. One, they went to cattails, which they continued to do. And two, at the very best, they were doing 28 parts per billion phosphorus. So we almost, we jumped them up, which put a bigger load on the WCAs. And of course, the cattails expanded in the WCAs as well. Now, we can grow cattails for free. It doesn't cost a dime to flood a field and put water in it. The cattails are going to grow. Or we can go back to where we were getting 18 parts per billion performance out of the SDAs and get some submerged aquatic vegetation in them. Because right now, there's very little of that left. And I know that cattails are a quick way to get the numbers down, but they will never get them to 18 parts per billion. Never. Cattails are for free. They cost you money to grow SAV. And again, I congratulate these folks. They got a tough, tough, tough job and a lot of pressure. Too much of it political lately in order to get these SDAs working as they should. The most important thing is the park water is at seven or eight parts per billion phosphorus today, thanks to what these good folks are doing. The WCAs and all the projects are working already before everything's done. So congratulations to all of you guys. Thank you very much. Drew, next is Mr. Tom McVicker. All right, I've hit the unmute and I'm gonna presume you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. I don't know if it's a help or hindrance to have been involved in this so long, but I'm gonna consider it a help. And it's very encouraging to hear the dedication that the current staff has to making these things work and, and uh, honoring the history of how they got where they are. I think it's tendency to always expect more out of every project you build than you thought you would get going in. But this one in particular, we knew when we approved those STAs that there were other options that had different benefits. For instance, uh, we knew hurricanes would be a problem for STAs and that's proven to be the case. We knew that too much lake water would be a problem for the STAs. That's recognized in the language in both the Everglades Forever Act and in the consent decree. Um, another thing I'd like, I think we don't remember often enough is when the Everglades Forever Act was passed, there were seven sugar mills. There's now four. Uh, 100,000 acres of farmland has been converted towards restoration, primarily water quality treatment. I know it's fun for a lot of people to say, oh, the EAA did this or the EAA did that and the EAA should do everything. That's, that's just not the case. And, it, and it's also important to remember that the EAA is people, it's families. And when three sugar mills close, thousands of jobs are lost. Uh, people that have raised their families and sent their kids to college for decades uh, have to find something else to do. It's quite a burden, and that's a burden clearly recognized by the leadership in the state, and that all of that was on the table when the EFA was drafted and passed. To me, it's the most successful piece of legislation in the history of water management in Florida. Um, there's no other BMP program to match the one the EFA put in place. There's no other tax the farmer program to match the one that the EFA put in place. There's certainly no other phosphorus reduction to a natural area to match the one that we've achieved with the EFA. It's a tremendous success. I'm a little sensitive. I don't like when I hear people point out only the flaws and not the strengths. Uh, so I think it's important to remember the strengths and it's very heartening to hear the dedication through that you and your staff have to continue uh, to reap the benefits of the Everglades Forever Act. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. I have no additional hands raised. All right. Well, thank you, uh, RAC participants, uh, for participating today. Thanks, for public for tuning in. And I want to thank you, Yvette, uh, for uh, managing uh, this uh, RAC meeting, and a Angela and Henry for making it work uh, via Zoom. Um, I hope everybody uh, has a wonderful afternoon and go have some lunch. Thanks for tuning in to the RAC Forum. 
Thank you.